Let's just play soft. Sometimes you just got to let it get into your spirit. How many of you know that your God is great today? time musicians let them get it in their spirit sometimes you just have to reflect back over your life Think about the times that God has been great in your life. For me, it was Monday. Then it was Tuesday. Then it was Wednesday. Then it was Thursday. Then it was Friday. Then it was Saturday. And then it was Sunday. Wait, then it was January. And then it was February. You get the picture. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody bless the Lord wherever you are in this place. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, oh God. We thank you, Father, for being a hedge of protection all around us. Father, thank you for being the bridge over troubled water. Lord, most would say that you have been a doctor and a lawyer. Father, I just come to know you as Jesus, my Father. And no matter what claim we make to you, no matter what name we infer or reference regarding our relationship, the lowest common denominator is just simply our Father in heaven. And so, God, we thank you for being that, and we thank you for being so much more. Lord, we love you today in spite of ourselves and we thank you today in spite of ourselves so father as you prepare to speak a word to us on this morning let our hearts and mind be clear let your word resonate within our souls so that when we leave this place we won't leave the same way in which we've come but we will leave revived and renewed by the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Come on, church, now let's give God another hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. It's good just to see everyone here on this morning. As we're still in the midst of our COVID transition, amen, we'll see just a few more every Sunday as we come out, amen, that is our prayer, but we just want to be diligent in our approach as it relates to serving under COVID conditions, amen, that's enough for COVID, he gets no more credit on today, amen. Amen, beloved. So I want to go back to the word of God in which we 
I preached on last week, which was a very, very familiar passage of scripture coming from the eighth chapter in the book of Matthew, the eighth chapter in the book of Matthew. For those who have your Bibles, you can stand, please stand for the reading and the hearing, amen, of God's holy word. Amen, and, and, and you could turn this monitor up just a little bit. Amen. And so, beloved, and, and there's three ways most pastors or preachers, the way he or she prepares sermonic material, typically we may preach it from a topical perspective, which means that you're taking a topic and you're taking a bunch of scriptures for scripture support and reference but we're not doing that today. Or you can preach from what's called an expository perspective, where you simply go verse by verse, and you just preach the verses as they come in order. Or you can preach like we're preaching today, which is called a textual preparate, preparated, prepared message. Prep prepared, oh Lord have mercy. <laughs> Which means that we take the canon or the thought of a particular passage or a group of passages of scripture and we meticulously move them together in order to support our argument. So today from a textual perspective we're dealing with verses number uh, 5 through verses number 13 and we concluded our textual evaluation in verse 13, which simply says, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so it be done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour, or the same hour. And beloved, we started this little mini-series dealing with this subject called the power of being positive. The power of being positive. You may be seated in the presence, hey man, of our Lord and Savior. Uh, <laughs> the power of being positive. Beloved, ever since we started dealing with these passages on last Sunday, my, my phone has lit up Chris and people have been saying pastor you know what it wasn't until I read that book of Matthew and I started getting a different illumination of the passages as it relates to where I am currently today see that's the thing about the Bible the Bible is a living breathing organism and the acronym that those of us who believe the word of God simply says it means it is basic instructions before leaving earth. And, and so, 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 so the Bible is a living, breathing document, which means that for those of us who are saved, we can read James or John or Matt, Mark or Luke on January, and it means one thing, but we'll read it maybe in uh, June, July, and August, and it may mean something totally different. Now, now the reason this happens, beloved, now the reason it happens is what we know as the Canaan of the text, or the main theme of the text. That never changes, because what God said is what God said. But what does change is the illumination of the scripture. This means that the Holy Spirit says, while you were experiencing this and you read it this day, it applied to your life like this. But now that you've gone through something different and you're reading the same passage of scripture and you have a new set of experiences, now this same passage of scripture is applicable now to this in your life. Oh, beloved, isn't it good to know that the word of God in which we read, teach, and preach is living, it has never, ever died. The power 
of positivity. We, we closed the theme, we closed the thought on last Sunday uh, coming out of uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, which simply says that, therefore, if any person is in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away, and behold, the fresh and the new has come. As a new creation, you don't have to allow the old things that kept happening to you to affect you in your new life in Christ. So, so before my new life in Christ came, I was an old creature. Now, I don't know what that creature was, but, but through, the, uh, through the thought of active deductive reasoning, it wasn't a better creature than I am now. I think I can agree to that. Uh, uh, see, uh, I physically, mentally, psychologically, uh, even sometimes physically had to go through a change in order for God to really be able to use my life. I, I had to change because what I was before wasn't good enough for God to do what he needed to get done with today. Watch this, watch this, watch this. All animals, including humans, go through changes. Oh, Lord, help me somebody. Uh, including biochemical changes, uh, uh, physiological changes, uh, morphological changes, and even anatomical uh, changes. Changes continue throughout our lives as cells die and they replicate and as age morphs our bodies, but with most animal changes are slight and even often imperceivable. The word, watch this, the word metamorphosis, metamorphosis in the Greek, it means to change or to transform in shape. It entails an immature form transforming into adulthood. Let me say that again. It entails an immature form transitioning into adulthood. It, it entails something that's immature uh, in its immature form. And in order for it to go through metamorphosis, uh, it must come out or transition into adulthood. Going from one type of life form to a completely different one. So because I'm a new creature in Christ and I understand what the word metamorphosis means, it means that God took me while I was in the midst of my spiritual immaturity. He, he, he seen me in the midst of my spiritual immaturity where I didn't understand the context. I didn't understand the Canaan. I didn't understand the desires. I didn't understand the faith. I didn't understand the belief. And as long as I was in the midst of my immaturity, all he could do was just watch me work. I'm, 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 I'm working, but I'm immature. So, so because I'm immature, guess what? My work probably really isn't even working. Uh, mm, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm working and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but because of my lack of spiritual maturity, I'm not getting a lot accomplished. Oh, I'm working, I'm working, I'm going to church, uh, but I don't stay. Uh, I'm in the ministry, but I don't work. Uh, I sing in the choir, but I don't show up. Uh, I'm on the deacon's board, but I'm not paying no tithes. So, so, so when I was here, watch this, I was still saved, but I was spiritually immature, uh, 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 and I was only saved because of open mouth confession. See, there's a lot of people who have open mouth confession, right? They, they believe in if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, but it's not until they leave from that place and they get into a place of maturity where they believe in thine heart that God has changed them from the dead and thou shalt be saved. Over here, I'm mature. So over here, it don't care what you say about me. I'm still going to show up. In my maturity, I don't care who talk about me. I got work to do. In my maturity, you can come at me any way you want to. Guess what, baby? It ain't going to stop what I'm doing because once I left being this creature and now I'm this creature in Christ, you can't do nothing with me. 
you talking about the power of positivity, you have to understand when you're here and you're immature, it's hard for God to get anything out of you until you grow to up. Somebody's saying that, well, well, I was positive over there. You was. <laughs> you was positive you was finna quit. It's positive you wasn't doing your best. It's positive that you wasn't even trying. Watch this, church. Watch this. The hardest part of being set free from your negativity and facing the truth is saying, I'm a negative person and I want to change. I can't change myself, but I believe God will change me. And as I trust him, I know it will take time. Oh, my God. And I'm not going to get discouraged with myself because God has begun a good work in me. And he is able to bring it to full completion. I'm not going to get discouraged because God has began a good work in me and he is well able to bring it to what kind of completion? To full completion. I, I'm not going to get discouraged with myself because God who has started a good work in me, he's not going to stop until he brings me to full completion. See, a lot of us, we stop being positive before God can finish his good work. He who had started a good work in me is not going to leave me until the work is completed. Now, the problem with a completed project is if you're not the project manager, you won't always know the steps to the projects. Listen, I was walking in the vestibule, and I noticed that we have a project going on in the vestibule. And so in my timeline, I figured that I gave the workers two to three weeks, and they should be finished with the project. Here we're going on week number four, and the project's not finished. So in my mind, I'm going to my chairman, like, what is going on? This project should have been done already. Well, what he had to tell me was, Pastor, we couldn't finish that project until we fixed the roof. And now that the roof is fixed, we can get back to the project. See, see, I was ready to fire the people who was working. I was ready to get rid of those who was a part of the project. You know why? Because I didn't understand the whole layout and everything that was going on with the project. See, sometimes a project can be spelled out A, B, C, and D, but it don't mean that it's going to go in that order. Well, what are you saying, Pastor? Well, that's what God is saying in your life. In the midst of your project, you keep showing up, and because it's not looking the way you want it to look, you're ready to quit, you're ready to throw in the towel, you're ready to fire everyone, but that's not what I need you to do. You're not the project manager. Wait on me to finish the project. Because here's what would have happened. If we would have finished the project without fixing the roof, then we would have had to come back six months later, fix the roof, and refix the project. And this is what God is saying keeps happening to you. Because you won't wait till I finish uh, the work that I started in you. Every time you turn around, you got to start all over again somewhere else because you didn't wait for me to finish the steps. Oh, man, I'm preaching to somebody who want to listen. You, you ever been somewhere and, and, and things was going good and all of a sudden you felt like you had to leave? You felt like you needed to throw up your hands? You felt like you was ready to quit? And guess what? You did quit. And about two, three months later, that same thing, you had your hand on, somebody else stepped in, and now they got that thing working. 
that thing working like it ain't never worked before. All right, well, let me say it your way. This going to help you. You ever had a real nice woman and you didn't take care of her and you treated her like trash? Now you see her three months later. Uh, she's with somebody who loved her like you never wanted to. She's dressed up. She's smiling. She's looking good. And you know what, man? You looking at yourself like this was the same woman I had. Yeah, it was the same woman you had, but she found somebody that was investing in her the way you would not. Oh, my God. See, it's all about the perspective in which you look at things. Your perspective will let you know whether it's going to be positive or whether it's going to be negative. Uh, watch this. Watch this. He who start a, or began a good work in me he is able to bring it to full, to full, to full completion. According to John 16, 7 and 8, says, however, I'm telling you nothing but the truth when I say it is profitable or advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the one who stands by, uh, will not be able to come into close fellowship with you. But I go away and I will send him to you so he'll be in close fellowship with you. And when he comes, he will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin and about righteousness, about upright of heart, about right standing with God and about judgment. I started a perfect work in you and just because I'm leaving don't mean the work is over. So God left with us. Oh, my God. He left with us. Uh, 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 the tri-partner of his being, which we know as the Holy Spirit. And why is this particular passage of Scripture so important to our textual demonstration? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, a lot of us are wondering, how in the world can I go from being this negative Nancy, uh, this doubting David, uh, <laughs> this dastardly uh, dum-dum, in, in order to get my myself into a place where I'm positive Paul? How, how, how can I get there? Well, can I help you? You can't do it by yourself. <laughs> You, you can't do it by yourself. It's not until the Holy Spirit takes up residency in you and allows you to have some experiences in life. And this is why he's saying in the 16th chapter of John that he has come. So what? So that the work that has been started will be completed. Ah, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't hit you well. All right, all right. Let me say it this way. Ask the Holy Spirit to convict you each time you start to get negative. This is the part of his job. That's why we read John 16, 7, and 8. And it teaches us that the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and convince us of righteousness. So he will convict us of sin and he'll convince us of righteousness. When the conviction comes, ask God to help you. Don't think you have to change yourself. All you got to do is trust yourself. <laughs> Man, this thing good to me. It's good to me. Even though I was extremely negative at one time, God let me know that if I would just trust him, he would cause me to become very positive. I was having a hard time trying to keep my mind in a positive pattern. Now I can't stand negative things. It's like a person who smokes. Many times a smoker who has quit smoking can no longer tolerate the smell of cigarettes because now it makes them sick. Well, beloved, I'm the same way with weak need Christians who keep talking about how saved they are, how controlled they are, how set free they are. And then as soon as trouble come their way. Oh yeah. Yes, I'm a bill and I'm only a bill and I'm sitting here on. Y'all remember the sad, sad song? 
They got a sad song, Jermaine, for every situation, every scenario, and you're telling me that the Holy Spirit has residence in you and you're still singing your sad, sad songs? Uh, every child of God ought to have his own song when the Holy Spirit takes up residence. Mine is amazing great. <laughs> How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Now you got your own song and you got your song, but stop putting your head down and start lifting your verses up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm the same way about being negative. I was very negative at one point. Now I can't stand negativity at all. It's almost offensive to me. I guess I've seen so many good changes in my life since I've been delivered from a negative mind uh, that now I'm opposed to anything that's negative. God has been too good to me in order for me to be negative about anything. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, God's been too good to me, to uh, he, uh, M E. He's been too good to me. He's been too good to Dwayne. He's been too good to Marlo. He's been too good to Lo. He's been too good to Reverend D. He's been too good to Pastor D. He's been too good to Pastor Dwayne Simmons. Uh, he's been good to me. And so, because he's been so good, I can't be so negative. Joe, I'm preaching. Man, I'm preaching. And when God has done anything in your life, you don't have the responsibility of allowing negativity to come in your situation. Stop talking about how good God is, and in the same breath, you talking about somebody else or how bad your life is. Don't do that to God. Power of being positive. I face the reality, and I encourage you to do the same. If you're sick, don't start running around talking about how sick I am. I want you to walk around and say, if I had not been sick, I wouldn't have been able to see him heal me. You have the ability to turn it around for yourself. It is unwise to refuse to face or reface reality. However, if our reality is negative, we can still have a positive attitude towards it. Always be ready mentally to face whatever comes. Come on, Chris, believing that God works out all things for the good. Watch this, Acts 17 and 11. Thank you, Jesus. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Can I read it one more time? These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They took their time, Lord. To make sure that they audio lined up with their video. Watch this. Dave and Tanya and I, we believe that our ministry, oh my God, help me, in the body of Christ would grow every year. I, I was fool enough to believe that. Church, I was foolish enough to believe that just because of who I am, because who my wife is, the ministry would just grow. And just every year it would grow, and it would grow, and it would grow. Jermaine, I thought I was going to experience experiential growth. Experiential growth isn't just growth. Experiential growth is growth times 10. That means that they laying on top of one another. And for a while, Jan, guess what? We experienced experiential growth. 
and we were on top of each other so much, Fred, that we had to get out of this place, this place, this place, this place. And remember, Chairman, we, we packed up our little Mount Pleasant stuff and we, we put it in books and, and Chris, we put it in containers and, and, we, and we so journeyed on down the street. I watched in a matter from 2012 all the way up to 2016 that I saw this church grow. We left with 200 and all of a sudden we were at 300 and all of a sudden we were at 400 and all of a sudden we were at 500 and we were on our way to 600 and then God showed me something. God said that the reason your experience, experiential growth is because you're talented, but you're not gifted. You're good, but you're not anointed. You're full, but you're not swollen. There's a difference between a growth and a swelling. A growth stays. Swelling goes down. I'm, I'm speaking prophetically. This is why my, my, some of you might be struggling with this. And so God said, Dwayne, here's what I need you to understand. As it related to Abraham. Abraham, watch this. Hope being gone, hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations as he had been promised. So numberless shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered the impotence of his own body, which was good as dead because he was about a hundred years old. Or when he was considered the bareness of Sarah's dead womb, no unbelief or distrust made him waver or doubt God concerning the promise that God has given him. But he grew strong and he was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. What does this have to do with this? Beloved, there was a time in Abraham's life where he could not see this generation that God was talking about. He could not see that his generation would be as numerous as the sands on the beach. But he didn't have to see it. You know why? Because his hope was in God and he understood that there comes a time when your hope and your faith they come manifesting together and as long as you have hope in God's word it may look this way today but God can turn that thing all the way around tomorrow I've got to get my hope back a lot of preachers because of this pandemic we've stopped hoping now we stopped hoping now hope was all we had Queenie you didn't stop hoping for that record deal mama you didn't stop hoping for that business Fred, you have stopped hoping for that better opportunity. Lord, you stopped hoping that your consulting firm would grant you 500 more people this year. I can walk through everybody's story. You stopped hoping that God is going to grant you your own church. You stopped hoping. You know why we stop hoping? Because it's so much easier to just accept where we are and say this is what God has in store for me well it may be in store what he has for you right now but he didn't say stop hoping he didn't say stop preparing he didn't say stop trusting what he is saying is while you're there right now get everything you need because when I release you when I set you free you're going to have everything you need that's going to be profitable for you. Too many people 
won't get what they're supposed to when they're supposed to. Chris, you're not supposed to be here forever, but while you're with me, get what you're supposed to get. See, our relationship had nothing to do with me, you, and music. God needed you to see this man been married for 30 years. You better ask him what it takes to stay married 30 years. Ain't got nothing to do with this, Chris. Somebody, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we have professed, for he is faithful. He is promised. He is faithful. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Then Paul concludes his thought by saying, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power, by the power by the power of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, once there was a man who was running a business and it had faced severe losses. And the man had to sell his properties and cars to continue running his business. Seeing the situation, the son asked his father, why are you still running the business? When you see that all we continue to do is lose and lose and lose. Why, why don't you just shut the business down? The father smiled and replied, my son, life can bring us many challenges. And even when we can't see our way through, we still must have to have some hope. We cannot overcome all the challenges, but we can overcome some of the challenges. Son, how uh, hope will help us? The father said, okay, uh, let's try something. I'm getting ready to show you. The father took his son uh, to a big well, and he asked his son, I want you to jump into this well. The son in shock said, father, I don't know how to swim, so I cannot jump. But the father pushed his son to the well, and while he pushed him in the well, Deacon Hamilton, the father, went off and hid. He watched from as far as his son struggled, and he kept on trying to float for close to five minutes. And after that time was over, when he was about to be drowned, the father jumped from out of his hiding place. He went to the well, oh my God, to save his son. The next day, the father again took his son to the well and asked him to jump again. The boy, with some hesitation, jumped into the well, uh, beloved, and the father again went into his hiding place. The boy began to struggle uh, to keep afloat, and he pushed against the walls of the well harder and harder. Time kept on running, and even after 15 minutes, he was pushing himself. Then the father came, and he pulled his son out of the well. Father asked his son, why are you pushing harder today than you did yesterday? The son replied, yesterday, I was not knowing what I was supposed to do when you pushed me into the well, and with fear I drowned. But today, I know that you will come and save me if I'm about to get drowned. The moral of the story is life can bring about many challenges, but when you push yourself with the hope of overcoming it, when you push yourself of the hope of trusting it, when you push yourself with the hope of trusting those who are around you, then you'll be able to get out of your own well. Yes, sir. The negative people that have encamped themselves around your well they step by every now and then to look in, to take inventory, to see how far up you've climbed or how far down you've fallen. And if you're surrounded by people who only want 
to measure where you are or where you are not, then you need to leave those people alone and find people who come with Rome long enough. It don't matter how low you are or how close to the edge you become, they got enough rope to throw you some support. They didn't come to the well to see your position. They didn't come to the well to see your status. But what they did is they came to the well already prepared to get you out. It doesn't matter how far you got to go. I don't need people asking me where I'm at. I need you to ask me, how can I help you out? Give God a hand clap. you say I'm a sinner in need of a savior and no matter who you are no matter where you are you can come by letter by baptism or by Christian experience it is my desire that this ministry will grow by 200 people by the end of this year it is my desire that you will sow seeds into the atmosphere for the continued growth and excellency of this ministry it is my desire that you won't continue to lay at Bedside Baptist, but you'll say, let me come out and be a part of this congregation where we were told to forsake not the assembling of the saints. Beloved, here you'll be surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who can help you get out of whatever the enemy has allowed you to get in. Listen. If you're out there today, regardless of whatever social media platform you're on, you can be saved. Make sure that you connect with us through our Facebook page or through our Instagram or go to our website, which is www.mtpbc.org. There you can send up a prayer request to let us know that you want to be saved. And then also there. When you're ready to sow a seed into this ministry for it's been a blessing unto your life, there's a donate button that connects to all of our financial pluses that we have in place. We thank you on today. We thank you on tomorrow. And our prayer, our prayer, beloved, is that something has been said or done that's going to encourage you to run on to see what the end is going to be. In Jesus' name I pray. 